Good morning, friends. My name is Claire. I'm going to be reading today's text. We're going to begin reading in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church. I'm Justin. I'm the student pastor here at our uh, Poto campus at Cross Community. I'm um, glad you're here. It's an honor to be here with you, uh, privilege, and, and uh, so I, I just want to pray over this time right now, if, you don't, if you'll let me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, this day that we're able to, able to gather, and, and um, man, thank you for the music, the worship through, through music. Thank you for our, all of our leaders, how talented they are, Lord. You give them so many t- talents and just the words that were sung. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that. We want to worship you through song. We want to worship you through your word as well. And so, Lord, we just pray. I pray right now that uh, distractions go away. All the problems we have in our life go away. We just kind of focus on what you have for us. And I say this a lot, but I want to say it again this morning. Lord, I know that none of us are here by accident. We're here for a purpose. And you've got something for everybody here. And I ask that um, these would be your words and not my own. Ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, flatlined, the first verse, dead in our trespasses and sin. And so we have a pulse, and then we just we have to understand that that we have no pulse when it comes to spiritual deadness if we're not in Christ. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. He's writing a letter to this this region and of course, it was writ- it, when it was written, there was no verses, there was no chapters. We add that because we can reference it, right? And so we reference in this letter, chapter 2, verse 1, and he's talking to Christians, the church at Ephesus. There's maybe can be unbelievers that hear this. And so this morning, we're talking to Christians, and there could be unbelievers, of course, here as well. So there's two ways to look at this verse. He's saying, remember, you were once dead in your trespasses and your sins. Or maybe you still are this morning dead in your trespasses and sins. Whatever category you're under. And think about that for a minute, though. Let that be a sobering thing to think about. Dead in sin. No life. Just just dead. No heartbeat. No hope. Just dead. We we are really concerned about uh, physical death as a people, as a society. We talk about it a lot. We don't like to talk about it a lot too, right? We don't like to talk, talk about physically dying. But let's make it clear this morning. I think we all understand that we're eventually going to physically die. Okay? We don't concern ourselves with spiritual death. That's what Paul is talking about here in this letter to the church at Ephesus. He's talking about, he's talking about spiritual death. Okay? We need to acknowledge and we need to admit that spiritual death is way more important, church, than physical death. Way more important. I repeat that. We have to admit that spiritual death is way more important than physical death because we do not have to spiritually die. We don't have to spiritually die. We're in a new series, Never Be the Same. And the, 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 talk, the t- topic I'm speaking about is admit this morning. Admit. We're talking about eternity here, right? This, about, this idea of spiritually dying, they're talking about eternity forever. I know it's hard to wrap our mind around forever. We, we use that term a lot, forever. I love you forever, and this forever, and that forever. But man, really forever. Think about that. I, I don't, I, 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 I'm not a smart man sometimes, but I can't, I, my, my mind can't figure forever out, right? I don't, I don't know. But that is what it's talking about, forever. And, it's, and, and that forever is real. That life after death, either you're going to have it in Christ or you're going to be spiritually dead and not have it in Christ, right? He goes on in verse 3, he says, again, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and a mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Man, does that, is that familiar to you? Think about that. Carrying out, we once lived 
in the passions of our flesh. And before we knew Christ, we're filling that, that hole we have, the big old God-sized hole with everything we can, every passion we get a hold of, right? We're filling it with something. The passions of our, carrying out the desires of our body, man, whatever we want, man, in the mind, whatever we want, we were by nature children of wrath like, like the rest of mankind. In order to desire a relationship with Christ, we have to understand what sin is and understand just how deep it runs and flows through our veins. When a young person, or anyone for that matter, a full-grown person, comes to me, and maybe they've accepted Christ and as their personal Lord and Savior, and I'm talking to them, and I you know, um, want to make sure you know, they know what they did and, and kind of talk to that situation, I'm looking for one thing. First, I ask them. I mean, I'm not, it's not a trick question. Why do you need to be saved? What do you need to be saved from, right? I, I don't want to hear, well, I don't want to go to hell. Okay, none of us do, right? But I'm looking for that S word, I'm looking for that S word. I'm looking for that word sin when I'm asking this question. I have sin in my life, Justin. I fall short of God's perfect standards. I'm, I don't measure up, right? That's what I'm looking for, something like that. Our sin runs so deep that, you know, the older I get, and I, and I can't really explain this. I, I tried to flesh this out and try to say, well, how can I explain this? And, and I can't. But the older I get, the more mature I become in my life, or maybe even the more, the mo the more mature I become in Christ. I'm not sure, but regardless, is the more I realize the depth of my sin. Like, man, you know, I, I feel like I just kind of, years ago, I was just kind of a, just a good old boy. Oh, yeah, I need Jesus, but, you know, I'm not perfect. Once you stop comparing yourself to others and really realize, just focus on yourself, you're like, man, I fall short. I fall short of God's perfect standards. Apart from me, I, I've really figured out uh, big time that I'm, uh, I'm sorry, apart from Christ, I'm dead. I'm dead in sin. So I have to have Jesus. I mean, I, we all need Jesus, right? But I, I mean, I've really realized that. It's, I, and I wish I could explain. Um, maybe I just think about it more than I did when I was younger. I asked I think Brandon on staff earlier this week, I said, yeah, you know, I shared this with him. He's like, no, I pretty much knew I was pretty bad back in the day. I was like, okay, well, I must not have thought about it much, you know? I don't know. But the older I get, the more I realize this, this how wretched I am apart from Christ. It, Isaiah 64, verse 6, a very sobering verse. He says, we all have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Man, check your motives, right? Why do you do what you do? Why are you doing the good things that you do? Is it to give you glory or give God glory? I mean, I mean my righteous, Isaiah is saying, all of my righteous deeds are like polluted garments. That's a, ESV has a good way of saying that, a nice little way of saying it. A lot of translations say filthy rags to God. Filthy rags. My good deeds. What? Seriously? Uh, my, but my good deeds? Yeah, Justin, your good deeds are like filthy rags to God, polluted garments to God. My best foot forward, the best I can muster up, apart from Christ, like filthy rags to God. I promise you it's going to get better in a minute. It's going to, you know, I promise you. Hang in there. Hang in there. We'll stop talking about sin in a minute. There's two types of sin that we can, uh, translations. Let me translate this verse for you. I've heard it translated this way, kind of Justin's translation of Ephesians 64, 6. is my best efforts infected with sin. Right? My best efforts infected with sin. We commit sins of omission and sins of commission. You may have heard these terms before, probably have. Committing a sin, sins of commission. You're going up to committing an act, committing a sin, right? That's sins of commission. So it's, and, 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 and again, it's not just acting out on something, it's our thoughts too. I mean, we just learned uh, in our last series, the Ten Commandments series, right? Jesus talks about murder. I'm sure you came in that morning when Jason was preaching on murder, and I'm like, huh, this ain't for me today. I've never shot anybody. I've never stabbed anybody. I'm good. What's he got to do? I mean, come on. I should just stay home. Right? Then you're like, dadgum. 
Really? Jesus had to go out on a sermon on the mountain, preach that sermon, and talk about, talk about the, the Ten Commandments, talking about hatred in your heart and hating people, and that's like murdering in your heart. Yeah, I'm guilty. I'm really, I'm really guilty of that. I'm really guilty of that. People don't even know sometimes. I go to a football game. I'm sorry if you're a referee in here. It's so horrible of me, but I, I've, I've murdered several in my heart. On TV, there at the game, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm horrible. Yeah, and most of the time they probably got the call right, but I didn't see it, so it didn't matter. Right, it don't matter. Murdered them. But seriously, it's serious, right? Uh, uh, adultery, I haven't, I haven't done that. Good. Uh, have you had a, lost, a lustful thought? Oh, yeah. Looked upon a woman with lust? Yeah. Oh, guilty. You're like, man. So, yeah, sins of commission is not just acting out and committing sins, and I've done, we do plenty of them, but it's our thoughts, too. Our thoughts. Sins of omission. It's like doing, not doing things we should have done, right? Omitting out things we should have. Are you giving sacrificially? Are you giving back to, to the Lord with your, with your offering, your tithes, with your, with your time? Um, are you praying? Are you spending time with him in prayer whatsoever? Are you spending time with your heavenly father in his word? Right? Are we omitting them things out? So sin, sin runs deep. Let me stop talking about sin for a minute. I think I've convinced us, and I know I've convinced myself that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But there is good news. I'm going to share with you right now a verse I've shared a lot lately. I feel like I've shared it um, with our youth group. I've shared this with um, the football team at Poto. I get to, I get to speak with them uh, on Thursdays. Uh, I've shared it at the, at the, the, the Four County Doorsman Banquet at the end of that uh, with 700 people. I love this verse. This is the best verse in the Bible. It's not up there yet. You're like, what's he going to say? There it is. The best verse in the Bible. God demonstrates, I'm sorry, different trend. God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Man. Whew. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the best verse in the entire Bible. We don't have to go fix ourselves. All these sin problems we have, if we're, you're an unbeliever in here this morning, you don't have to go fix yourself. You don't got to go get better, do better for a period of time. Your good does not have to weigh, outweigh your bad because it never will. That's radical, church. That is radical stuff right there. Seriously? While I'm in my sin, in, in, in the middle of sin, Christ died for me? That's not normal. That's love that I can't, I can't, I don't know. That's, um, that's radical love. He died for us. He's calling our name, my name, and your name while we're in the middle of our sin. Doing the deed, omitting it, committing it, Right? We just have to admit that we're a sinner and we fall short and choose to follow him. Be born again. You may be in here today and you may be saying, well, Justin, I, I'm a Christian. I'm forgiven. Amen. I hope everybody in here is, right? Man, because we don't have to spiritually die. We can live forever spiritually. I have chosen to follow Jesus, but I've got sin in my life. I've got certain things in my life. I'm forgiven for it, but I just I got stuff that haunts me. I got stuff I can't overcome on my own. I can't overcome these things on my own. The great apostle Paul was in our boat, in your boat, my boat as well. He says in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, and that is in my flesh, he was a Christian, right? The Holy Spirit dwelled within Paul. He knew Christ, but he's in my flesh. I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. Like in his own power, the strength he could muster up, he couldn't carry it out. 
As Christians, we, we, we have issues. We're not perfect. There's stuff we got to just battle through. Listen to this. We have to admit we are powerless over addictions, over brokenness, over sinful patterns in our life, and that in our power, our lives can be unmanageable. Let me read this again. We have to admit we're powerless over addictions, over brokenness, over sinful patterns. In our power, our lives are just unmanageable. So I'm going to admit two things to you in my life this morning. I'm just admitting to you this morning. Two things that's drug me down when it comes to fleshly desires and doing what's right. And I cannot shake them on my own. I've tried and tried and tried. Two things. Yeah, I'm a believer. Christ dwells in me. But there's, two, there's just some things that I just, I continue to struggle with. Number one, that food is an idol in my life. I can worship it. Number two is my anger. My anger. Number one, food. Food's a hard one. Foods, man, food's a hard one for me. Um, so let me, let me give you some excuses because I like doing this, right? I'm going to give you some excuses why food's hard for me. Because food is good. Hey, I have to eat to survive. If I don't eat, I'm going to wither and blow away. You're like, well, Justin, that may take you a while, right? I mean, you go a couple months. Well, that, that may be true. But eventually, if I stay away from food, what's going to happen to me? You're going to come pat me on the shoulder and say, can I buy you a cheeseburger? You're, you're not looking very good. Okay? But it's true. I have to eat to survive, right? I don't have to do illegal drugs to survive and abuse them. I don't have to drink a lot of alcohol and get drunk daily to survive. I don't have to have sexual sin in my life to survive. So yeah, I said, that's what I say to myself. I convince myself. I got to eat, man. Right? But seriously, it becomes, it becomes an idol to me real quick. Um, I like food. I'm a foodie. I, 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 hey, I, some of y'all know I, I, I own a chuck wagon. You cook off a chuck wagon. And, and I have a little YouTube video. We do some outdoor cooking. and show people how to do it. It's fun. And I like to eat that food I cook. Um, it's fun. I like entertaining people. I like having people over. I like doing big stuff like like. Big, 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 big meals, big smokers, big, big crawfish bowls, whatever. I like that stuff. It's fun. It's the way we fellowship with one another, breaking bread with one another. It's good stuff. But if I am not careful daily, I have to put a lot of thought and effort into it and really, more than anything, rely on the Holy Spirit, pray, be prayer, prayerful about it. Because if I don't, gluttony becomes part of my diet real quick and in a hurry. Real quick and in a hurry. Become something I worship. Something I run to. Not just to fill me and sustain me for the next few hours of the day or whatever. It becomes an idol. An idol that I worship. And I've dealt with this my whole life. Yeah, things have gotten better, but it's because I've got to continue. Continue. Because in my own, this, in my own it, it don't work. It don't work. My grandpa had an anger problem. My dad had a short fuse as well. So guess what? That can be my default. That can be my default. Something I feel like I'm powerless against. I'm not for my relationship with Jesus. And just stuff I'm not proud of. I mean, just, you know, go from zero to a thousand. Just getting mad so fast and in a hurry. You know, with losing it with my kids or losing it with my wife. Just, just man, stuff that I'm, I'm ashamed of. I mean, circumstances, it can be just anything. It can be a, a bolt can't get out or a stupid cow that just sort of makes me lose it all the time. God bless them. I mean, just frustrating things. You just, man, you know, um, I have to realize that on my own, these things, I can become a slave to it. All these things, I've become to a point where I have to admit I cannot do this on my own. I can't fix it on my own. I can't white knuckle it. This kind of stuff I can't, I can't just, oh, I, I, I can do it. I can do it. I can do I can do better, right? I can't read enough self-help books. I can't put enough boundaries around that I don't need to cross, right? It does not work because ultimately 
I will fail if it's up to me. I have, I, believe me, I have a track record. If it's up to me and my power, I will fail. I become again, I become a slave to it. But here's the good thing. There's hope in Christ, right? Even for Christians that are, are having trouble getting through things and, and, and all this stuff, there's hope for us in Christ because this verse is not just for um, help you hit a home run or, 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 or um, score a touchdown, but I can do all things through Christ, Christ who strengthens me, right? We know that verse. It's used out of context all the time. But I can, I can conquer addiction to food through Christ who strengthens me. I can, I can conquer my anger issues through Christ who strengthens me. And I've got several men in my life that I confess to that hold me accountable. Guys in my community group, and the guys here on staff, I get a double dose of it and I need it. I admit to them when I fail and they hold me accountable to my actions. We all need people in our life that we confess to and that we celebrate wins and victories with. Speaking of victories, I want you guys to watch this testimony, this video. Growing up, I went to church. My family attended every Sunday and most Wednesdays, but if you were to peer behind closed doors, you would see a very dysfunctional family unit. My parents divorced when I was really young, and the households that I grew up in were ranging from neglectful to abusive. I was sexually abused by a family friend as a girl, which led to really low self-esteem that I struggled with for years after that point. As an adult, that translated to me looking to relationships as a way to find my worth and value. By 21, I'd had a child with a guy that I was not married to and with whom I shared a very hollow relationship. I ended up jumping from relationship to relationship when things ended with him and None of them ever made me feel fulfilled. In that, I turned to the one thing that I knew could make me feel even marginally better about myself. And I drowned my sorrows at the bottom of liquor bottles and used meth as a way to try and forget the pain of the problems that I felt I was having. It was during this period that I found myself wrapped up in an abusive relationship with a guy that was horrible to me. If it weren't for him though, I never would have met my husband, Matt. He was an addict at the time that we met as well, but we fell head over heels for each other and were married shortly thereafter. We talked at the beginning about our mutual need and desire to quit using, but it didn't take us long to realize that our addictions had a lot stronger hold over us than we had previously realized, so we kept using until one day we got a knock on our front door and our house was raided. It was only after having lost everything that I eventually got to the point where I realized that the only option I probably had was to look up for my help. And it still took some time after that for things to start turning around for us, but eventually they did. We were able to reconnect with our families and were presented with an opportunity to start over in life, which is when we moved down here to Cameron. And sometime after that, we found a church, which was a place that I hadn't stepped foot in for over 10 years in my life. But to my surprise, it was here that I gained a family that has loved and supported me through one of the most difficult seasons in my life. My husband is currently incarcerated because of the charges that he caught while we were in active addiction. And that's why I started Regen. After having faced utter helplessness, I knew that God was calling me out of my own darkness because he wasn't finished with me yet. He's always working around us, and while I don't always see why he is continuing to do a good work in and through me, I put my trust in him for my healing. I've learned what it's like to feel loved. I have found my worth in my relationship with Christ. 
and I've gained the confidence I've searched for throughout my life. Since starting Regen, I have gotten custody of my daughter back after nearly three years since losing my rights to her. I've gotten enrolled in school and I'm pursuing a life dedicated to prison ministry after I graduate. Matt is also enrolled in school and is gainfully employed through a work release center that's close enough to home that we get to actually visit him in person on a regular basis. Jeremiah 18.4 really speaks to me as a person walking through recovery. It says, the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. It's a reminder to me that God doesn't look at our sins, our mistakes, or our broken pieces as a pile of unusable or tainted material. He sees all of us as usable and ready to be remade into holy vessels for His purposes and glory. Regen is not a place only for individuals recovering from addiction. We all have struggles, hurts, and parts of us that feel broken. My hope is that people that hear about this ministry and who may feel that tug in their heart like the Lord is calling them to give it a try will respond to Him the way that I did. I felt like that pot marred in the potter's hands. But through this program, I have discovered that there is healing on the other side of any pain or anything that we may walk through. God's waiting for us wherever we may be in life. And I can truly say that I am more than glad that I've responded to him calling to me. <laughs> Amazing. Lola shared that testimony with us in our youth group last spring. I just think of Romans 5, 8, right? God demonstrates his love for Lola and while she was still a sinner. Christ died for her. He climbed up on that cross for Lola while she was in the midst of that sin and died for her. You know, that's a verse that, um, that's very missed in our society. It's the part of the gospel that people don't get. You just see little things. I see things on TV or this or that, talking about God or people being interviewed, and they just don't. This is, this is totally missed. I pray in here today you understand what this means. It is missed because we're conditional lovers. All of us in here are conditional lovers. We love conditionally. We like to admit it. I mean, I love my children, I love my wife, and I would die for them. I, really, I would. I'd put my life on the line for them. But there's times that I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated. I'm not going to say I love them less, but boy, mm, there's times I can wring my kids' necks. You know, them moments for us with, 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 with God is he demonstrates his love for us. While we're still sinner, Christ died for us. Think about something for a minute. Just do me a favor. If you close your eyes for a minute, and I want you to think about something. This might be kind of hard to do, but I want you to think about your worst day, the day you were at your worst, the day you may say, man, this, this is the most sinful day. Maybe, maybe you've got multiple days. You know, maybe you've got a, a season of your life. That you're at your worst. Years, I don't know. Close your eyes and think about that moment. The moments, the moment, the, the span of time. You just were really unlovable. That moment is when Jesus died for you. He saw that moment and loved you regardless anyway. That's the gospel, church. That's the good news. That's why I'm up here today. That's it. That's it. That moment, not, not, not the moment you're at your best or you, you're perceived best, not the moment you, you feel like, well, I gave a lot to the church that morning, uh, tipped the waitress real good that Sunday, went to church, went to both services, went to a community group after, man, I'm, I'm hitting it. I'm really polite to my wife. No, not that day. Because that day was still infected with sin, right? There's two ways we can respond this morning to, to this kind of message. 
Number one, it's about admitting that us Christians in here, even though you're a believer and you're forgiven, you've still got things in your life. You have problems. And we, man, we can overcome them through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. You have stuff, you have to admit you have stuff you can't overcome on your own. And there's two ways I believe we can, we can help with that is number one, uh, the recovery ministry, regeneration. Oh, it, meet Tuesday night, six o'clock in the youth room. Come this Tuesday night, six o'clock. Show up. Show up. Like she said, you don't, you don't have to be, have this, lo- I mean, we all need it, guys. We all need regeneration. That's the fact. We all need it. Second way uh, that you can uh, combat this is, is be in a community group. Man, if you're not in a community group, get in a community group. It has changed my life, having community. I really don't know. I have no idea what i do without it. Zero. I just don't know. I would not. You realize real quick that everybody's got a lot of problems, Right? We're, we don't have it all figured out. None of us do. We break up a lot with men and, and women in our, in our group, and I get to talk to men and, and just tell them, you know, where I'll fall short. I, I, ask, I, I confess sin. I, I, I ask for prayer. So regeneration, community group. We have to admit that, that yeah, we're believers, but, but, but we fall short. And, and we've got stuff in our life that, 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 that we need help with, right? That we need to confess to. Second, this morning, if you're not a believer in here this morning, man, surrender it all to Jesus. Gosh. If you've never done that, today is your day of salvation. You don't have to walk around spiritually dead anymore. Christ died for you on your worst day while you were still a sinner. That's how much he loves you. You can be alive in Christ. You can live forever spiritually. You can do that by just saying, I'm centered and I want to follow Jesus. That's what you got to do. That's it. Give your life to Jesus this morning. If you've not done that, what are you waiting for? You'll wait till next week, the week after? And God's calling your name. He's calling your name. I, uh, mm, my dad died in 2016 of cancer, of colon cancer, and, and um, he, um, man, we prayed for, for physical healing, and, um, and God didn't really answer, didn't answer that prayer. We had a lot of things going on with him. Dad did. Um, some heart problems as well as cancer, and uh, we prayed for that, and, 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 and and, uh, of course, we praise God regardless. You know, it wasn't in his will to, to heal dad, to physically heal him. And um, when we came to a point, to be honest with you, towards the end, I never thought I would pray this, that, 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 that the Lord would take him home. And he was suffering so much. And um, it was hard, so hard just to, to see and be a part of that. Um, so he asked me before he passed away if I would advise preach his funeral. And I said, of course. I'm honored to, right? And so I'm on my porch after he passed away, and I'm just trying to, man, I'm, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. They're everywhere, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing stuff down, and I've got my phone out. I got the, um, I don't know what the app is. You talk into it, and it takes notes for you and, and all that, whatever. And I'm just talking about my thoughts, and I say something. And I don't know, it's the Holy Spirit, but I just, I said something. And I said, my dad was healed. The truth is, in June of 1998, he was healed. At 42 years old, he accepted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. I was in Dallas, Texas, working down there after graduating college. I had a job, and I get a call Sunday afternoon from my dad, and he calls me up as a son. I've accepted Jesus. And I remember just the joy. <laughs> and uh, that don't happen very many times with, for 42-year-old men. 
right? And so I shared that. That was what I talked about during his uh, service. My dad was healed. The only healing that matters, church, nothing else matters. We're all going to physically die, but we don't have to spiritually die. We can spend eternity with, with Jesus in a place called heaven, and we do not have to walk around spiritually dead. And so my prayer this morning is that you're healed. If you're not, have you never been healed this morning? That's my prayer. It really matters. I promise you, it really matters. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Let's pray. I mean, Father, we come to you and, man, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for Romans 5.8. I'm so thankful my good that it's not have to outweigh my bad because it, it won't ever. I thank you so much for the sacrifice you made on the cross for my sins. Lord, for the believer in here this morning that's got habits and hang-ups that they just can't overcome, they just need to admit it and they need to get help and, 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 and Lord, they got to figure out, like I did, that I, I have no power over. I can be a slave to it. Lord, I pray that folks get, get, get in the light with this stuff. Get out of the darkness and get into the light. Be part of a community group. Be part of regeneration. Get people in their life to confess to and help them, help them through things. Encourage them along the way. We, we're not meant to do this stuff on our own. For the folks in here that, man, they don't know you. They're, they're, they're spiritually dead. They've been, they're, they're flatlined. Lord, they come alive in Christ this morning. Lord, I pray right now. Gosh, I pray. That you will just reveal yourself to them through your spirit this morning. Lord, I pray right now you just reveal yourself to them in a huge way. Over, overwhelm them with your spirit, with your love. And I ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can-